thank you for joining us this weekend. We're glad that wherever you are, that you decided to tune in. Um, we are here. We're ready to worship as you God's word is being taught. Um, and we know that God is good. And times are different and change and move. Um, but God is faithful. And we know that. And uh, we've been working on some songs. And I'm excited to sing them. Darkness tries to roll over my bones. When sorrow comes, just feel the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
If you're anything like me, the past couple weeks has been frustrating as every day we are reminded of friends and family that are getting sick and certain freedoms that are being taken away as a lot of us are being trapped in our homes. And so we wanted to remind you of some wins that we saw this past week. Our service as of this moment, a couple minutes ago of last week's service has over a thousand views and each of those views was probably multiple people in a room. One of those rooms was a living room at the Smith's house. And for me, a bunch of young adults got together, and it was about 20 of us that got to worship together. So JP's here to share a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, last week, uh, I usually work with middle schoolers every Sunday morning, so I usually don't get a chance to worship with people uh, my own age. But last week, uh, in the light of all that, that is happening in it, during this coronavirus time, uh, we were able to go to the Smith House and worship. There were about 30 of us gathered in a living room, laying on the floor, uh, on couches, five people on a couch, just worshiping our Lord and Savior. And there were multiple, multiple uh, places all around our church body that this was happening. Our church got flooded with pictures of, of families worshiping together. But it was amazing to see uh, an experience uh, 30 people in a very small room worshiping our Lord and Savior. And so that's what I wanted you guys to do tonight. Wherever you are, uh, wherever you guys are going to be tomorrow morning, I want you guys to engage in worship. Worship with all your heart, whether it's you by yourself or whether you're in a room filled with five of your closest friends. We want you to worship and engage in worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, this season that reminds us how frail we are. As Pastor Mark said last week, when we have these moments, it makes your gospel that much more powerful. And so would you give us spiritual eyes to see where we can share the gospel this week? Would you help us not to fall into a spirit of fear and anxiety? Remind us of the wins each and every day. Help us engage with our family and our friends. Give us creativity, God, as we are... Um, social distancing from, from other people. Help us creatively reach out and, and give where we can and serve where we can. So, God, for all the people in our church that have small businesses, um, though it's good to be reminded that we're frail, God, they're scared. And so would you just, would you encourage people to eat out? Would you encourage people to reach out to their, their friends and family that run businesses that we would be the church this week? So thank you for this moment to worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, church. It's very odd not to be joined with you all. But we are so thankful for the technology to still be able to come together in this way. And I don't know about you, but I've been on social media way more than I ever have before. Because that's the way I'm able to bring out connect with the people that I care about most. And sometimes that can be a scary thing seeing so many negative things, but other times I've just been reminded of the goodness of God so many times this week through posts friends have made because they've had a little bit more time to sit down and write out a story of what God has been doing, and I've been so encouraged by those moments, and so I just would love to kind of challenge all of you to, to stop and think, where have you seen the goodness of God this week, and can your story encourage somebody else? And help them see that, y'all, God's still on his throne, and he's there, and he's still good. And it's through hard times like this that we get to come through and we get to stand and say, all of my life, you have been faithful, and you've been good. And not saying it lightly, because we mean it, because we know it, because we've been through it. So I would love it if you could go on our Facebook page or here on the video and just comment a story of where you've seen God's goodness and how that can encourage so many of us. I can't wait to go and see what you've written. And so now, this next song we're going to sing, it's the first time we've all sung it together, but that's what it's about, the goodness of God. So while we sing, think about your story, think about where you've seen the goodness of God, and get ready to share that with others.
Tonight's scripture reading is from the 46th chapter of Psalm. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, hello, everybody. Good to see you again as we gather wherever we're at. And yes, it again, it has been one incredible week. Wow. More briefings than you could ever imagine, and I hear we have more coming, so um, stay tuned. We're going to continue to keep you posted. Every time uh, a news brief happens, we'll continue to send out things to you. So, uh, But we're always going to be here. We'll continue to share the Word of God, and it's good to hear from you. It's been great. Um, Actually, uh, you all have been really communicating well. And I love a lot of your questions. I've got a really good one this week. Uh, I'm going to address it on the Wednesday bulletin. So if you don't, haven't gotten into the kind of the sequence of that, we're doing the weekend services and then we have a number of, did did you notice Jim's joke? Man, somebody actually posted that made their day. It made Jim happy, too. But, uh, by the way, we're going to be doing some more things like that. But Wednesday, we're going to be doing some, uh, just kind of the bulletin of the week that I'm doing. I'm going to give you some updates on some of our missionaries. Uh, Most of them are doing well that I've connected with and been connecting around the world. We had one kind of have a little bit of an emergency scare, but they're doing well. And uh, they're kind of hunkering down. Most of them are remaining in country. And uh, some of the countries are uh, experiencing a lot of the same thing we are. European countries in particular are doing, uh, not doing very well. African countries so far are doing well. But I'll give you a little bit more of a bulletin on that one on Wednesday so we can get updated on that one. So uh, looking forward to just communicating more with you and, uh, on the weekend. So these have been fun times. 
Um, again, like I said on Wednesday, people enjoy it. Some people have really appreciated, like Garth falling asleep on my sermons, and they don't wake anybody up. Others, um, you know, like Xander loves snuggling with mom in bed. So it's like take take you up on this stuff because um, you know, in a few weeks, you got to come back and sit in chairs and uh, fall asleep with me here in church. So. Now you can do it at home, and no one sees you, and grab your hot chocolate, push pause, the sermon's boring today, let's go play, but pretty soon you're going to be on house arrest, so you can't play, and just uh, repeat it again, so watch it, have fun, it's been a great time, so, oh man. We're going to be uh, giving some announcements at the end of the service today, so make sure you watch because we have some suspenseful announcements about all activities and things, so make sure you stay tuned to those things coming up. One of the things that I like to do, I love to do it, in fact, actually, I love to give blood. I I don't, I'm not sure, I think I'm somewhere in the six-gallon range uh, that I like to give um, over the years, and I, I love to give blood. I'm not sure why. I think it's because I actually think I'm saving a life. I kind of imagine that uh, I don't have a really rare blood type. I think it's A negative. So if you need some, I'll give it to you free. But um, I love giving blood. I feel kind of redemptive. And But there's one part of it that is always, for whatever reason, kind of comical to me. They're there, and they've scrubbed it, and, you know, they put all of the stuff on, and I'm pumping. And then she, or he, this phlebotomist, gets this rather long needle, and she says, at the most inopportune time, about when they're ready to stick the needle into my arm, they say, now relax. I'm like, really? This is not the time that I'm going to relax. You're about ready to inflict pain on me. Now, I've done it, uh, I don't know how many times, dozens and dozens of times. But it always kind of amuses me that just about the time that they're going to inflict pain on me, she tells me, relax. It's kind of inverse of what you would expect. It, it's kind of, I think, like today. Today, it's really, it is. It's, well, crazy. It's frightening. It's hard. I just talked with a gal today. Uh, she got fired. She didn't get fired because she's a bad employee. She's a phenomenal employee. She got fired because they're not doing any more elective surgeries until June. And I, it never made any sense to me. I thought all nurses would be busy forever. And her life got turned upside down, like a lot of people. And, and in that moment, it would have almost seemed insensitive to say, eh, relax. Kind of like when somebody's about ready to inflict pain on me and put a needle in my arm, relax. And the reality is, if I were the one saying it, I probably would say, yes, it seems insensitive, maybe even rude. But it's not me. In the height of probably what is, for all of us, the most challenging season that we've ever lived through, God says, relax. He does. Four weeks ago, the economy was booming. Four weeks ago, the stock market was at 29000 Four weeks ago, unemployment was at its lowest in, what, 50 years? That's what they're telling us now. Unemployment is skyrocketing. The stock market is down in the basement. And God still says, relax. Insensitive? Indifferent to us? To being fired? To... No. In Psalm 46, he says, Relax. Why? Because it's not about what you know that causes you to relax. It's who you know. It's not about what you know. 
Everyone wants to know when is it going to end. Everyone wants to know when is the stock market going to come back. Everyone wants to know when is the economy going to recover. Everyone wants to know when am I going to be able to fly again. Everyone wants to know how long is it going to last. Because if we knew, then we would feel confident. And then we could relax. The psalmist says, don't lie to yourself. The key to relaxing is not what. The key to relaxing is always who. Look at verse 10 with me. In this psalm. I hope I know you're at home and you got your, you're all cuddly and everything else. Get your Bible out. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I think a lot of moms over the years have used this passage in church and said, God said, be quiet. It's not really what it means at all. It's not be still, like be silent. It's not be still, like be passive. It's actually, the term means metaphorically, let your arms hang down. Now, when do your arms hang down? When you're relaxed. When your arms, when you're all tense, you're up here. When you're tense, you're all defensive. And when you're relaxed, when you're still, when you're vulnerable, when you are ah, feeling kind of good about life, your arms come down. What's the secret of that? He said, is you've got to move out of your emotions into what you know. Now, what's happening for a lot of us, and it's true, it's not uncommon, and it's not something to feel ashamed of, but it is something to tackle, and that is, what a lot of people today are doing is they're allowing their emotion to drive them. When your emotion drives you, for all of us, what happens when your emotion drives you? Your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, your arms come up, you get tense, your muscles constrict. Everything happens that way when you become a person that is responding out of emotion. And oftentimes, when we hear the news, in fact, if you want to do something kind of weird, put a blood pressure cuff on and just watch a news briefing. Just take your blood pressure before and take your blood pressure after. My guess is, once you watch another news briefing, watch four or five of them. Watch a whole afternoon of Fox News. And man, I'm telling you what, you're going to be 215 over 106. Why? Because whenever you do that, whenever you just get more and more, you're going to start thinking in your mind, what if, and what happens then, and all of a sudden you begin to worry about stuff, and then what about the kids, and what about this, and and where have you gone? You've thought about all of the emotional things. Where are you thinking? You're in your emotions. You're in your fear. Go back to this verse again. Where's the emotion in this text? It's not there. Be still. That's not an emotion. Relax. Let your arms down. How? Know that I am God. You see, who you know is far more important than what is going to happen. That's what the text says. The issue of relaxing, the issue of being still, the issue of being quieted is not a matter of moving into my emotion. It's the actual movement into knowledge. Probably a lot of you remember this who are my age or in that vicinity. And it'll give you an illustration of this. Back in 1980, it kind of resembled today. The United States was in the ditch economically. Russia, powerful. We, the Iran hostage situation was going on. And and we kind of had an identity crisis as, as a country. We weren't in good shape. We were in the Olympics 
And uh, we, the hockey team was playing. It was a Sunday, and we were going to play against Russia. And that was back before the professionals could play. And so everybody knew. I mean, it's like we were playing the Russians. And the Russians, they started, you know, training when they were six months old. And, and our kids started playing hockey. Well, we just didn't play hockey. That was for Canadians and Russians. Please forgive me for those of you who love hockey. We didn't play hockey that much. So we were going to be killed. Everything about, and we, we tried to rescue the, if you remember those times, we tried to rescue the hostages and the helicopter went down. And it was like everything was bad. And so we all knew. We went to church that day and we kind of prayed a prayer of sacrifice for the poor hockey players because they were going to get slaughtered. We came home from church and we were all astonished. We were winning. And then you thought, God, did you hear our prayers? But I knew, I absolutely knew that, well, there's no way. They're not going to win. These are the Russians. See, these guys grow beards at the age of eight. They're going to kill us. And, uh, I mean, our guys all look 14. And uh, got into the third period. And, uh, man, I am telling you, I mean, my... My heart was just leaping out of its chest, and I was nervous, and I was sweating. I don't even like hockey. And I was watching the game, and I was like, could we? And I didn't want to allow myself to think about that. And I was like, might we? Well, for sure, we did. I mean, if you remember that, it was a miracle. In fact, everyone said, it was like, do you believe in miracles? Yes! And it's a great movie. You've got to watch it. The networks played that over and over and over again. And I watched it a number of times. And the funny thing is, I never, ever had heart palpitations again when I watched it. I never had my palms sweat. I never got up and paced the floor. I sat there and relaxed. Why? Because I knew how it turned out. He said, well, Pastor, well, well then... The secret of life is knowing how it's going to turn out. Well, the fact is, God doesn't tell us how it's going to turn out. I have no idea when this COVID-19 is going to turn out. I have no idea when we're going to turn the corner economically. God doesn't tell you that. That's not what the text says either. The text says that the secret to relaxing is not knowing what is going to happen, but who? If you know God, then you can relax. If you know that I am God, He says, your arms will come down to your side. God's not some mystical figure. He's a real God that you can get a grip on, he says. And there's real things about God in this text that he says, I want you to know, because if you know them and if you embrace them, no matter what the governor says on Monday, no matter how restrictive it gets, no matter how crazy this virus gets, God says in the midst of that, your arms. And relax. Now that's saying something because I, I, I think the things that people are facing are huge and challenging. People are getting fired. We have one of our ladies in our church that her husband is in the hospital. She can't go visit them. We have somebody whose mom is in the hospital. She can't go visit. And we have people who are having babies and I, I don't know if they can go visit. I mean, there, there are things that people are facing that are so challenging. We have people who are dying and they can't have funerals. There is just so much that people are facing. Is it rude to suggest to them relax? No. Not only is it not rude, but it's kind. Because God says, if you know Him, your arms will come down to your side. Your heart will slow down. And the future won't seem as frightening because your heart will be still. What is it? The 
says, I want you to get a grip on the real God. There's three things that he tells you in this text. Number one, starts at the very beginning. God is our refuge. What does it mean that it's God is our refuge? It's something that you come into for protection. A refuge is something that you get out of a storm. A refuge is something when the hail is coming down and it's it's huge, it's the size of a tennis ball you get out of so that you don't get damaged and you, your, your head's not cut open. A refuge is when the meteorites are coming, you know, the meteors are coming and they're, they're going to hit the earth and you, you, you hunker down. A refuge is when the enemy is coming in and, and God comes in there to protect you. Job experience God as a refuge. It's not that God protected him from all of life. You know Job's story. Job had, had it rough. Job lost kind of everything that is precious. He lost his children. The only thing Job didn't lose was really bad counselors and a less than stellar wife. But he lost his business. He lost a lot of things, but he, he didn't lose kind of the things that were kind of a nuisance. But what happened is, is that God protected his life. And I think in some ways, what's miraculous about Job to me is God protected his soul. God protected his heart. God protected his mind. Job came to that place where all of this happened, and yet he came to that place where he said, God, yes, I will praise you. I will not give up on you. Because you have protected me. What is a refuge? It's the ability to have God, at the end of the day, give you enough strength to finish. It's the ability to find a way to keep going. And God says, I will do that for you. I will be your refuge. I will be your strength. I will be your ever present in trouble. I got a note this week. He actually came to our principal at Sunshine, and we're just, again, talking with parents. We have the same kind of challenges a lot of schools do. I was working with Corbin this week and some of the challenges of students and every institution that we're involved with is, is dealing with the issues that this virus is, is transpiring and giving to us. And I was reading a little note from a family and they just sent us this most gracious note. Please keep our money don't credit us for next year. We love you, and we support you, and we'll be there next year. Sometimes when God says, I will be your strength and I will be your ever-present help, sometimes He uses people. Oh, sometimes God uses the supernatural, but oftentimes God comes into your life and He sends a person. I've heard of people in our church getting flowers dropped off to them. I've heard of people receiving text messages from a person that they don't normally receive a text message. And I can't help but think that it's God that inspires a person to send those texts. God's your refuge. And you can expect in these moments when you face some of the greatest challenges you might ever face, God will be God. And he'll let your arms come down. Because every day, he has chosen to be your refuge. It says also in this text, in verse 7 and 11, that God is your fighter. It doesn't say fighter, but if you'll look at it, it says, The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our Lord of hosts. What is that? What is a Lord of hosts? It's a it's an angelic name for one who fights for us. Really, God fights for us? Yeah, He does. God goes before us and He fights for us in ways that we don't even fight for ourselves. He fights for us, and, and what I like to see, or what I envision is, is that God fights for a vision that sometimes we don't even see ourselves. I think of Joseph. Joseph never saw himself as the rescuer of his family and his nation. He saw himself as a younger brother, and he always wanted to be with his brothers. And, oh, he he thought well of himself, but I never believe in a million years that Joseph imagined himself as a man who would save his family and save his nation. But God did. And God fought for him. How did he fight for him? Well, he got him sold into slavery. Well, that's a good job, God. You're doing a great job. And he fought for him and got him put him into prison. Oh, Lord, you're fighting well for him. You're doing great. What do you mean he fought for him? He fashioned him. He created him. He touched something of character in him. I'm convinced in some of these days there is going to be character forged in some of you. And there's going to be some things that God does in you as the Lord of hosts that will last for the rest of your life. There will be some of you, because you are finding yourself in the Word of God more than you've ever been, there are some of you, you've decided... Hey, you know what? I'm watching too much TV. Or, you know, I've watched everything on Netflix that I can imagine. And maybe I'll spend more time praying. Or maybe I'll spend more time journaling. And maybe in these next two weeks, if we really are on, if you will, house arrest, that we'll spend so much time together. One of the revivals I was reading about, uh, where where plagues had, had kind of forced people into homes, They had spent so much time together. Literally, non-Christian homes were having worship times together. Why? Because they didn't know what else to do. I wonder how God, the Lord of hosts, is going to fashion things in our families and in our lives when maybe He has hemmed us in. And maybe what God is doing is, is bringing us out of our distracted world into this world where smaller. But as my world gets smaller, my perspective of God gets bigger. And I discover that God is fighting for us. What do I mean by that? Maybe I'm not saying God is the cause of all evil. I'm saying that maybe God is going to use this. And that as you and I spend more time praying and more time thinking and more time wrestling with God, we may come out of this season much to the benefit of our lives with a greater faith. More relaxed. A grander view of God. Because we see Him more as our fortress. More is our deliverer. More is the one who has fought for us. It was William Carey who went as a missionary into India. He was a translator. And uh, this was well before, as you know, well before there was a cloud and well before there were places you could uh, keep your manuscripts safe. And William Carey had his manuscripts in his printing press and 20 years into his 40-year career, his printing press and the house that it was in burned to the ground. When his printing press burned to the ground, he lost the vast majority of 20 years of his work. Up in smoke. 
You wonder, God, why would you do that? How on earth is that fighting for a man? How is that protecting a man? How is that being a refuge for a man? 20 years into a 40-year career, and you wipe out nearly all of his manuscript work of translation. Terry wrote his pastor in England, Andrew Murray, and said, I need help. I need perspective. And they dialogued back and forth. And as William Carey began to process that loss, and it was a loss, he came to these two conclusions. God has a sovereign right to dispose of us as He pleases. And that's true. God has an absolute sovereign right to dispose of us any time He so chooses. And that includes 20 years of work. And He did that on that day. Secondly, He came to this conclusion. We ought to acquiesce in all that God does with us and to us. William Carey. How did God fight for that man? Maybe, maybe what God did in William Carey is the same thing he did in Joseph. William, I'm going to take your loss. Joseph, I'm going to take your imprisonment and I'm going to use it to save a nation. William, I'm going to take your loss and I'm going to take your character and I'm going to take your grit and I'm going to make you the father of modern day missions. And I'm going to use you to inspire a wave of missionaries you're going to lose 20 years of translation. And I'm going to use you to inspire hundreds of thousands of missionaries that are going to see millions of people come to Christ. You see, what causes us to relax is that when you discover that God in this moment, and friends, I don't know what you're facing. I'm not even sure what I know what I'm facing. Because I have no idea what this week is going to unfold for us. What I do know is that God is fighting for you. And what I mean by that is that God is going before me, doing everything He can to do in me and through me what is His vision for me. Relax. God's got you. Finally, What I think this text says is you can relax because God attaches His reputation to your life. He does. In this text, it says in verse 10, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Where is He going to be exalted? In your life. Oh, he's exalted in the nations. He's exalted in the earth. He's exalted in the heavens. But he's exalted in your life. Meaning, God is displayed through your life. People will oftentimes make a judgment of God based upon how he treats and loves you. Oh, make no mistake, when you declare yourself a believer and you say, I'm a follower of God, people say, well, that's how God treats His followers? Yeah, watch. God's not afraid of that. He's not ashamed of that, my friends. As you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as you walk through this challenging moment, be relaxed. God has attached His reputation to you. He has. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. 
I will display my glory in you. I will allow people to make judgments of God. This is what God does. I will allow people to make judgments of God based upon how He loves you. No wonder why He says, relax. God's got you. He does. This psalm, by the way, if you want to look at the backdrop of this psalm, go read Second Chronicles chapter 20. Most scholars will tell you that this psalm, the backdrop of it, is Second Chronicles 20. Where King Jehoshaphat is told there's three armies out there that are coming against King Jehoshaphat. And they're coming against him and they're going to take him out. And the odds are absolutely stuck against him. There's no way on earth that he's ever going to win this battle. The prophet comes to him and says to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, God has told me this battle is not yours, it's his. But you must obey and go out in the morning and be obedient. You must trust me. And Jehoshaphat trusts him and goes out in the morning, even though the odds are completely against him. When he goes out in the morning, he discovers that the three armies that he was going up against had all been slain before he had even lifted a sword. The backdrop of this phrase was odds like you and I face. They're stacked against you. The economy is bad. It's scary. The virus is moving. In some ways, it's kind of frightening to be alive unless you know God. I have no idea how long it's going to last. That doesn't matter. What matters is we have a grip on God. The fact that He is truly a refuge for you. That He will fight for you. And that He has promised to attach His reputation to your life. Martin Luther, the great hymn writer, theologian, was up against a great plague in Germany. And many of Christians were flooding out of the city when this plague came against them. And one day as Martin Luther was studying this very hymn, Psalm 46, he began to pen a song. A mighty fortress is our God. Bulwark never faileth. The more he wrote, the more he realized what God invites you to do in the midst of a plague is not run for cover. Not head for the highlands. Not protect your life at all costs. Not fear and panic. Not worry. Relax. Why? Because God has got you. My friends, He does. God's got you. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that we're not going to get skinned. It doesn't mean that we're not going to face challenging times. It just means that God has got you. And if that's the case, let your arms down. Because God is our refuge. He's fighting for us. And His name is attached to us. To our church. To you. And if that's the case, He's a mighty fortress. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing that song together. God, thank You for having us in Your refuge. In Your care. Ah, oh, thank You for loving us, for protecting us. 
God, would you particularly be with our friends who are in the hospital that we can't visit? Would you particularly be with those who lost jobs this week? And for any this week, God, who their anxiety level is just ratcheting up, somehow would you draw them more and more to the Word of God? Would you expand their view of you? Our mighty fortress is our God. Would you so expand their view of you that they would relax? Because you, you've got it. We love you, Lord. Amen. A mighty fortress is our God, of whom work never failing. Our Okay, church, stay with us for a couple more minutes and we'll let you know what's going on uh, in the coming days. Number one, we are watching the news just as you are, and so our what, what we can say is that we know exactly what's going to happen this week. What we can say is that we promise to communicate with you through social media, so be watching our pages for that. You can still email us, you can call us at the office, and if any of you would like to schedule a meeting with a pastor, we can do that through Zoom, FaceTime, or other means. Secondly, we need volunteers. We have created a list of people in our church that are more isolated than the rest of us, people that we can't get to um, with pre-existing health conditions or people in the hospital. And so we need volunteers to call them. So if you would like to be on that team of people that bless those that are more isolated than the rest of us, then please email us and we will send back to you a list of names and numbers so that you can call them. Number three, as you could probably guess, all activities at the church or sponsored by the church are, until further notice, suspended. And as the great theologian Reverend Pouch said last week, remember, draw near to God and wash your hands, you sinners. Cut, break, done. This is the, oh, we love you, this is the author of what he did now. Probably.